Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Our Community Cares. I just thought I'd give you the fashion statement. Thank you, my daughter, Eliza, and uh, Rachel for that beautiful uh, mask. So we're here for another great episode in our public affairs series, Our Community Cares. We have been running this for over a month, and we have brought to the community all kinds of important information about coping with the coronavirus world. We've talked about landlord tenant and unemployment benefits, healthcare workers, those uh, hospitality workers uh, looking for new jobs, uh, the, the benefits that are coming out of the federal government, the CARES Act. We've talked about mental health. We talked about the, uh, the surveillance project uh, doing uh, testing of antibodies and so much more. So if you missed any of those episodes, please check it out on Facebook. They're all archived there. And uh, we hope you, you will because there's a lot to learn. We're delighted today to bring you an episode with the wonderful Andrea Mercado. She has been a friend and a colleague and uh, her organization, New Florida Majority, has done incredible work. Um, you'll tell us, Andrea, for how long, but I know it's more than a decade. And I was around at the beginning too. So I'm very, very proud of the work that you're doing. And it's all about how to stay civically engaged in the coronavirus era and how to pay attention to the issues of disparities in our community and how we need to pay attention to the fact that people are not all affected the same and some groups have been uh, affected more than others. And what can we do to, to deal with uh, that and hopefully resolve it for the better as we come out of the, uh, the, the um, pandemic and look to a brighter future as we begin to open up and rebuild. So again, I'm Daniela Levine Cava, County Commissioner, District 8, and here we are with Andrea Mercado. She is the Executive Director of New Florida Majority. It's an independent political organization that works to increase the voting and political power of marginalized and excluded communities toward building a more inclusive, equitable, and just Florida. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me. Very, very happy that you're here with us. And we have a packed agenda, so let's get started. Uh, you started out uh, extensive experience as a community organizer, as I will add, did I. You worked on issues of domestic workers, women's rights, people of color. Can you tell us a little bit about those experiences? Yeah, so I um I went to high school, public high school in Broward County and um, had the opportunity, uh, a scholarship to go to university. And uh, I think when I graduated, I really wanted to give back and started working in really grassroots community organizations and community organizing. I worked at the Miami Workers Center um, and I actually went to California and worked with a very grassroots uh, Latina Immigrant Women's Organization. It was an organization uh, run by and for Latina immigrant women. And every week they would have um, kind of like support groups, uh, grupos de autoestima to talk about um, self-esteem and issues you were experiencing in your personal life and immigration issues. Um, and many of the women had experienced domestic violence. Um, and as they were trying to leave situations of domestic violence, um, many of them were working as nannies and house cleaners, like, you know, like women in my own family who had um, taken care of children or cleaned homes um, to, to put food on the table and make ends meet. And then um, we're finding that they were experiencing challenges in the workplace, you know, some employers who weren't paying them on time or not paying them at all or experiencing actually being sexually harassed at the workplace. And um, so I uh, started organizing nannies and house cleaners for worker protections and worker wow. rights. And we ended up um, starting a, a national organization, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and went on to pass domestic worker Bill of Rights legislation. Mm -hmm. It's now been passed in over 10 states. Um, and uh, after the uh, you know, I, I, I think after I had my own family, I really wanted to come home. Um, so I'm really lucky to be back in Florida and living near family. My family spreads from Miami to, to Jacksonville. Um, and, you know, after the 2016 election, uh, really concerned about um, 
the future of our nation and the kind of country that my, my daughters are growing up in and felt really uh, fortunate to join the team at New Florida Majority and do everything that we can to advance um, racial equity and immigrant rights and climate action. There's, there's so many issues that um, we're all experiencing and um, have been, yeah, really happy to partner with you, Commissioner Kava, on trying to make uh, Florida a, a better place for all of our families. Thank you so very much for the wonderful work that you've done and for your leadership now with the New Florida Majority. Uh, let me just remind our listeners that you can post your questions and comments in the Facebook Live post and we will get to them uh, towards the end of the program. So please, please do, do let us hear from you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your work having to do with hurricanes, before and after hurricanes and the vulnerable families. That was part of your groundbreaking work as well. Yeah, so um, I think I'd been with New Florida Majority for three months when Hurricane Irma was bearing down on the state. And um, organizers like Valencia Gunder and others saying, you know, when this hits land, um, it's, we, we know that it's communities of color and, and working families that are really gonna suffer. Um, because we knew that there were families that were already underwater before the rains ever started. Um, and when the lights went out, um, when lights went out for extended, uh, in some communities up to 10 days, um, we knew that that meant that, that there were going to be children going hungry um, and elders who couldn't have, you know, their medications and that it was going to cause a lot of hardship for so many families. So thanks to Valencia and so many other organizers that work in frontline communities across the state, we... Um, launched community emergency operations centers and launched a, a statewide coalition. Um, we know that there's so many grassroots organizations that um, are there to serve their communities, have really deep relationships in communities. And so um, we pretty quickly set up a, a hurricane fund in partnership with the Miami Foundation, um, set up community barbecues, pop-up barbecues. We went door to door. Um, you, you know, we're an organization at New Florida Majority. We, we go door knocking, you know, year round uh, to talk to community members and see what they're experiencing. And in a time of crisis, it's more important than ever to see how people are doing and what they need. Um, and so we were able to point people to um, that, that, you know, bar pop up barbecue that we were doing down the block. Um, but at that time, it was also a special election, if you remember. Um, and um, we would also say, and you know what, there's air conditioning at the local library and it's an early voting site. Um, <laughs> Very and, good. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think in these times of, of crisis, we're able to build on um, those lessons and that experience, certainly build on the coalition and the ways that grassroots organizations can come together, like the organization you, you led for so many years, Catalyst, coming together with so many other organizations like We Count and the Florida Immigrant Coalition and Dream Defenders and Faith in Florida. Like moments of crisis are moments for um, organizations yeah. that are dedicated to serving communities. Right. So let's yeah. give it to this crisis. Here we are in the corona uh, crisis. Can you tell us how you've responded now? Yeah, so... Um, you know, again, there's so many frontline organizers out there, uh, Gina Romero, uh, Kelly Thomas, Ms. Deborah, you know, there's people who their like life's work is um, connecting to people in community. And, um, and so we've been, um, a few things that we've done. One is our team that usually is out there every day registering voters at schools and at DMVs and at laundromats. Um, they can't do that anymore, um, but they're on the phones. And so they're calling people. And we've made over 300,000 calls at this oh point. My. Incredible. Community. Incredible. And, uh, we've talked to over 20,000 people. Um, and as we're talking to them, we're collecting information too, because we want to know what's going on um, and what are families experiencing. And I think what we've found, it, it won't surprise you, because I know you get these calls too. Um, people have lost their jobs, um, they're losing hours, 
Um, there's a lot of families that are food insecure. Over, over half, almost half of the people that we talk to either have elders at home or children. Um, and yet they're saying that they're really concerned that they don't have food um, or they're not sure they'll have enough food to make it through the month or they can't pay rent. Um, so we're listening to see what um, families are experiencing and then we're connecting people to resources. So um, we, we set up a website, floridacoronaaction.org. Um, many organizations came together to partner on building out a resource where people can find where testing sites are, um, they can find where food banks are, um, and it's all across the state, people have been populating um, Florida Corona Action and the map on there with, with resources for people. But it's also a site where we can take action. As you mentioned, we're an organization that believes we need to build power for our communities and we need to push um, elected officials to um, respond to the needs in our communities. And so we've done petitions around the unemployment crisis. We've also done petitions pushing big corporations like Publix to provide paid sick days um, to their employees. Um, tell, so, tell us about the lawsuit now. You have a lawsuit as well. Yes, we have to use all the tools in the toolbox, um, especially with some of our statewide elected officials um, that, you know, I think, you know, Governor DeSantis has been burying his head in the sand since day one of this crisis. And um, when the Florida preference primary on March 17th, that was right around the time that this coronavirus pandemic was escalating. And there were a lot of people who were scared to go vote, putting their lives at risk or students that came home that couldn't vote um, because it wasn't the address that they were registered at. Um, and we filed a lawsuit for an emergency injunction to extend the deadline to request a vote by mail ballot, you know, let people vote by mail. And we weren't able, we weren't able to secure the emergency injunction around the March 17th Florida preference primary, but we have used that lawsuit as the basis of an ongoing lawsuit um, to push um, the state of Florida to send vote by mail ballots to every single voter that's registered to vote. I know, um, you know, you're also worried about protecting our August elections and our November elections. It's the most critical election of our lifetime. Why can't we just automatically send a vote by mail ballot to every voter um, and make sure that our early voting sites, we make them, we make them safe for people that do choose to, to vote in person. Um, allow people to drop off their vote by mail ballots and, and fix some of the problems in our online voter registration system and our vote by mail system. Yes, excellent. And you and I had a chance to talk about this, I think it was just yesterday. I, and I'll, I also spoke to our election supervisor, Christina White, and she indicated that the state law doesn't provide for mailing everyone a mail by vote ballot, uh, that it has to be requested. Uh, and in Broward, they are sending the form to request it to every household. But the uh, resolution from Chairwoman Edmondson and our county commission was modified to be instructions would be sent to every household as to how to apply rather than the form itself. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that we definitely want to pursue because we want to make it as easy as possible, as simple as possible to encourage people to be ready way ahead of the August election to, to vote uh, by mail. And then fortunately in Miami-Dade, you can drop your uh, mail, mail in ballot, ballot to any early vote site. If you don't wanna leave it to the mail service, we talked about that too. So uh, those are some of the improvements that uh, I know you're pushing for and we will as well. Uh, so you also wrote a letter to state officials. You've been very active uh, civically on statewide issues. Can you tell us what that's, letter said? Yeah, so we've done um, several letters to Governor DeSantis and our state legislature. We've, um, again, you know, co come together with coalitions of either voting rights experts, um, like the ACLU, um, All Voting is Local, Organized Florida, many others, Advancement Project, um, really calling on, like, these are unprecedented times. Um, we need bold solutions to protect our elections, to, to protect our democracy in these times, um, but also take measures like canceling rent. Um, and we're, we were able to secure 
um, an eviction moratorium, but that um, that's running out. So we need the, the governor to renew um, that eviction moratorium. Um, and just a footnote in Miami-Dade County as well, we have our own local eviction moratorium and that will apply as long as there's an emergency uh, in place here in Miami-Dade County. And that's so important. And those were some of the gains that were made you know, during the hurricanes um, when we saw um, the impact that hurricanes can have on, you know, so many of our working families. Um, so I think we've had a lot of practice in figuring out how do we respond to, um, especially, you know, when crises don't impact all families the same. Um, there's economic disparities, there's racial disparities, um, and it's the role of government to, you know, commissioners like yourself and others to, real, you know, really um, push for the things that families need in a time of crisis. Great. Uh, let's talk about paid sick leave. That's something you mentioned before, and it's something I've been championing. I have legislation uh, locally to apply to all contracted employees under my Dade County contracts. It's hopefully going to go back to committee in May, and I hope that my colleagues uh, <laughs> got the memo that actually this really matters uh, because we did get some pushback about it at the last committee meeting, but that was before the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so tell us about that, and um, I understand you are working on that fight for Publix employees. Yeah, you know, we, we did do, you know, we were really, um, while many workers have lost their jobs, um, other workers have to go to work every day, right? Um, so many people are now deemed essential employees, um, the majority being uh, women. Um, and, and women of color um, are also disproportionately part of that essential workforce. Um, and yet some companies like Publix where, you know, we need our grocery stores and we need access to food, um, Publix as a corporation has blocked paid leave and other progressive policies in the state legislature for years. Um, and even in this time of crisis, you know, they won't change their policy. They're, they've been called out in the, in the New York Times and other national outlets as some of the worst companies when it comes to paid leave. Um, and, you know, so we really wanted to make sure that grocery workers um, are able to have the access to paid leave that they need, um, but also to protect people who are shopping um, at, at Publix and making sure that if people feel sick, they're, it, that's something that every employer um, should be providing. We believe it should be um, something that's legislated. Um, and we have heard, we, that was a victory, we have heard that Publix has changed its policy and now is offering paid leave. Um, it's not permanent, which is what we think that they should be doing. Um, it's, you know, for the time of this crisis, they're, uh, they're creating a paid leave policy for this time of crisis. Um, but it was, it's, you know, we, we are seeing um, a lot of the gaps in our, in our society um, and a lot of things that some of us have been calling for for, for many years, um, not having that is in, in this global health pandemic is, is a real problem for us to reckon with. Yeah, there's so much to learn uh, from this unfortunate situation where we do see people exposed for the disparities uh, in, in their rights and their salaries, their benefits. And as you say, so many of them are the essential workers who are underpaid and without the kinds of uh, workplace protections that they, they need. So thank you so much for your fight about that. Now let's switch gears and talk about unemployment compensation. Once again, we have achieved national headlines for the abysmal state of our unemployment system. I know you've been working on that. Uh, so tell us what are your thoughts uh, and what have you called for for change? I mean, it's um, it's a disgrace. It's it's really criminal uh, that so so many people have lost their jobs, and um, the state's unemployment system was designed to fail. Um, Rick Scott created a, a website that um, when he was governor um, that limited. Uh, how many people would receive unemployment benefits. And um, at this point, it is, uh, it's, it's an embarrassment. And beyond that, like there's so many families that are suffering right now that have been laid off, that, have, that are not able to get on the website. We actually just saw, I don't know if you saw that news, that the website is now down until Monday. Yes, until Monday. 
So people are not able to um, apply. And then even if they do apply, the rate of, we have the lowest rate in the, not only do we have the lowest unemployment benefits in the nation, the fact that it's only $275 a week is a disgrace. A um, disgrace. But it's also um, people who are applying for benefits have not gotten a penny. It was, there was an article in the New York Times on this today. Um, I know there's, uh, Senator Jose Javier Rodriguez, you know, has been fighting around this. Um, many labor unions like Unite Here, where so many of the service industry has been decimated. Um, I know all of us know someone who has lost their jobs um, because of this crisis. And um, we need to call on, call out, you know, Governor DeSantis. He needs to do an emergent, many executive orders. We want all of the claims to be backdated to the date that people lost their jobs. Um, we need the, the level of unemployment to be increased and then the number of weeks to be increased. It shouldn't just be 12 weeks. Um, we need to make sure it, it is much longer than that to, to meet this, this crisis. Um, and, you know, we, the, the, the level of frustration around this um, and pain yeah. and suffering this is causing families like really can't be under, overstated. So um, we do a lot of these food distributions and I know you do as well and promote them. And there was an interview I saw, uh, you know, it's just heartbreaking because literally people are eligible for these benefits, but they're not coming in. So maybe they're not being evicted if they can't pay their rent but literally they have no food in the house and mothers who are not eating so that their children can eat, uh, seniors. Fortunately, the county in Miami-Dade does have the call in number 311 and we are providing, uh, you know, it's now over a million and a half meals that have been provided. It's about 80,000 seniors a day. So it's quite, quite an operation, but you have to have, um, you, you know, you have to be over 65 and these food distributions require you to have a car. So you have to drive through the line. You can't walk up. So, you know, there are just so many barriers and it's, it's, uh, that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. It's just terrifying. No, and, let uh, alone, will, yeah. mm -hmm. no, and let alone commissioner, people who will never receive, you know, are not eligible to receive unemployment right. benefits because they're undocumented. You know, that's they right. work in our restaurants, they cook our food, you know, people who are part of our families and part of our communities that are being left out of the relief. Exactly, exactly. You know, uh, interesting point that the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, which has been recently uh, expanded by the acts, uh, I guess the president signed the bill today, uh, that money goes to an employer and is regardless of immigration status. Not to say, I mean, obviously people have to be legally employed, but if they're employed, they would be eligible for those benefits through the PPP program. So just a little point for anyone who might qualify, we want you to apply for that money through the PPP, and I commend the city of Miami for designing their own, and I'm bringing legislation for the, to, to seek funds from the county for the mm -hmm. county to do its own. So that would hopefully go to those who might not be eligible for the federal program. Okay, let's turn to the justice system. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the justice system's response to the COVID-19 virus? Uh, again, like we said before, this crisis is magnifying all of the problems and inequities um, in our society. And yeah. um, we all know that um, mass incarceration disproportionately impacts communities of color and poor people. Um, if you're black um, or you're Latino, you're more likely to be arrested um, for the same crime um, and more likely to receive a longer jail uh, sentence um, and not have money to pay bail. and um, and our, our jails and prisons are overcrowded um, and it's a real health issue. And so we, we have been part of efforts um, partnering with Dream Defenders, the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. There's so many organizations um, responding to the needs of people directly impacted. Um, and actually right now in half an hour, um, New Florida majority in Jacksonville is, has a, a, a protest around the need um, to release elders who are incarcerated, um, the, the need to release uh, people with low-level offenses. Um, you know, and, and we saw cases here in South Florida and not um, in immigration detention as well. Um, people who are being deported um, to countries, they're being, de they're, they're 
being deported with COVID-19, they're being deported to countries that do not have the health infrastructure that's necessary. Like Haiti, for example. Like Haiti. Like Haiti. Um, and it's, uh, there's so much more that just needs to be done. And so I know um, there are many people working on this issue. Um, it's a national, we, we incarcerate more people than any other country on earth. Um, and it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. I mean, we're people's lives. Right. Right. It's been quite the effort. And, you know, some of the states have had huge, huge outbreaks, of course, in what they call the Petri dish of the prison system. Uh, for now, in Miami-Dade County, uh, we do have cases and we do have a lot of testing and masks have been issued. Uh, but, you know, there haven't been as many cases, but there are cases and we know it will, it will grow. So it is a, a real tragedy. Okay, let's pivot to the environment. Uh, Wednesday was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. We had a special show, hour-long show with a great panel. Please go back and check it out. Even we ended with beautiful music about our environment. Um, what are your priorities for climate action? I know you're very active as well in this arena. Uh, so please tell us what you're working on. Well, I mean, that's the, we're, we're here experiencing um, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and it's a, global crisis, but there is another global crisis around the corner and it's the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, I think this, a lot of people have been reflecting on how um, the price of oil is plummeting because there's not enough places to store it because our airplanes and vehicles and companies, it's not business as usual. Um, but I do think that this provides like an interesting moment for us to reflect on um, the kinds of changes that um, we, we need in our world, um, in our society, and in our economy. Um, and what, there's no better time than now for us to think about what does it look like for us to transition, um, to, to have a just transition to another kind of world. Um, you know, we've been fighting for a long time in a state like Florida, where the sun shines, um, you know, through over 300 days a year, uh, we need much more solar energy and there's clean energy options out there available to us, but less than 2% of our energy currently comes from the sun. Um, so I think there's, you know, a lot of um, opportunity for change. Um, and this is a moment for us to really think about. I see so many people planting gardens, um, you know, using this time at home. Uh, to think about what are the choices that, you know, your family can make. Um, but, but really, we need uh, systemic solutions. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your incredible activism across the broad spectrum of, of issues in our society. And uh, we know you'll keep, keep on fighting, and it's a statewide effort, but we're particularly proud of what's happening right here in Miami-Dade County in South Florida. Uh, so uh, we, we stand with you and uh, we want to use this as an opportunity, like you say, to really expose the fault lines in our society. The fact that our essential workers have been devalued, uh, the fact that um, our environment um, plays some role in the spread of infectious diseases, that uh, we've seen a downturn in pollution, uh, our our waterways are clear, our wildlife is returning. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps to put these things into perspective. So hopefully we'll be able to turn the corner and recover uh, better and stronger mm -hmm. uh, and more equitably, more inclusive than we were before. So thank you for your efforts for making it so. We've had a number of comments come in. Everybody's kind of right on with the program. So we thank everybody who's taken the time to uh, post a comment. There was uh, one question about uh, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny Rodriguez, for um, pointing out that when people have asthma or other uh, health vulnerabilities, they're at particular risk during mm -hmm. this pandemic. And we need to be sure that as we reopen, we re reopen responsibly, slowly, based on the guidance. Two weeks of flat uh, or, or downward trend in new cases and deaths, and we don't have that here yet. Uh, so we need to, to be really vigilant, and those of us with uh, underlying conditions need to be all the more cautious, and we'll be taking that into consideration at voting time, right? We wanna be sure that uh, people can exercise their dem democratic rights without 
exposing um, themselves to health risks. So uh, let's just remind our listeners that we'll be back on Monday. We're going to pivot to the business community on Monday. We're going to hear from a group called Engage. They help businesses retool for this new economy. What are the new opportunities? Uh, and that is, is really critical that we, we look ahead in a way that we can employ people and retrain them and, and retool them as well. Uh, next Wednesday will be another blowout event. We're going to have a big town hall, so it won't be at the usual time. It'll be in the evening, six o'clock, and we're going to have healthcare and, and small business experts we also have a survey that's circulating, so please uh, check it out. We'd like everybody to answer our survey, and we would like you to sign up. You have to sign up for this town hall. Uh, it will be a dynamic, participatory discussion on things that we can do to help you in your business and help you in your personal life as well uh, to recover and rebuild. So thank you again, Andrea. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to tackling these things with you, and may, we, uh, may the force be with us, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Kava, for everything that you're doing in, in Miami to protect Miami working families um, and advance racial equity and um, encourage folks to check out newfloridamajority.org or check us out on um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, opportunities for folks to get involved. What we've been so um, amazed at is the number of people who want to volunteer in these times. Um, yeah. There's ways for people to volunteer remotely. And democracy happens 365 days a year, not uh, just on election day. Um, <laughs> I love that. So I like to end my show with uh, follow us, of course, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's Commissioner Kava on Facebook. Twitter and Instagram is DL Kava. But um, most importantly, stay home, be safe, be strong, and be kind. Mm -hmm.